That would be uncomfortable, you know what? <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist this morning. Trust you all had a good week. I sure did. It was a better week than before, the, the last few weeks, so it's been good. Order of service has changed a little bit, so we'll just start with, with the announcements this morning. If you're here for the first time, a visitor, if you want prayer, if you just want to visit, on the edge of the bulletin is what's called a connection card. You fill it out and put it in pastor's box, mailbox out there, and he'll pray for it. The elders will pray for it. We'll visit if we need to visit. Whatever you'd like, we're, we're here to help. Coffee's on this morning. Um, and I think there's some goodies too, right? All right, goodies, goodies. Uh, I want to remind you of 8.30 on Sunday morning. We, we have prayer time in the fellowship hall. Just a time to go before the Lord before service and Sunday school, and it's just, it's good to, to talk with the Lord. Monday night, 6 o'clock, prayer time here at the church. Monday at 7 o'clock, there'll be a trustee meeting here at the church, and I would assume that's in the conference room. Um, choir practice on Thursday at 5, and 6 o'clock on Thursday, wor worship team practice. And then next Saturday, we're going to start men's breakfast again. So men, come on out. Um, I would assume you're going to have something for us. Sure. Like bacon? Bacon, yep. He likes bacon. We, can, we know that from the sign in the window. <laughs> Looking forward, September 12th, uh, we'll be having a celebration of life for Lowell Randstrom here at the church. Um, he went home to, to be with the Lord a few months ago, and um, come on out for that. Uh, September 13th, we're going to be starting Sunday school for the kids again. And then we will have a missions committee meeting immediately following the service on the 13th. Bible study fellowship again starts on the 15th of September, but it is going to be via Zoom. So if you're interested in that, talk to Bert. He can get you all the information you need to get going on that. September 16th, we're going to have a cornerstone teacher helper training at 630 and on the 23rd, adult Bible study in Cornerstone to kick off. Supper will be provided at 6.30. Are there any other announcements this morning? If not, I'm just going to read a portion of scripture from 2 Timothy. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 15 and we'll go to verse 23. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are uh, two long names. <laughs> Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they ups upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows who those are his. And everyone whose name is the name of the Lord is, will abstain from wickedness. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold or silver vessels, but there are vessels of wood and earthenware and some to, to honor, and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses, cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. So this morning, Bert starts talking about a silo in Sunday school. And I'm thinking to myself, he's taken my material. <laughs> I have a 60-foot silo next to my barn. It's been there since 1970, 50 years old. And it is straight and true as the day it was put up. Why is that? 
Bert talked about the blocks, how the blocks of the silo are like the church family, how we all are held together, these blocks are held together. And that there's a coating put on the inside of the silo that seals the silo. And we're sealed in Christ if we know him. But one thing that wasn't mentioned is the foundation. The foundation that holds that 60-foot mass of concrete up. It's a picture of our, of our Lord. It's a picture that he is our foundation. And we need to stand on him. There are many things going on in our country right now, in our world. And we're hearing lots of things that, in my opinion, are foolish. We need to remember that our foundation needs to be Christ. And it needs to be what's in this word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather. And Father, as we pray now, we pray for the offering. We pray for this service. But most of all, Father, we pray that we remember to put you first, that you are our foundation, and without you, we would fall. Just like that silo standing on sand, it would tip over. But Father, on you, standing on you, we are strong and straight. Help us to remember that. Father, bless this service. Bless those that are here. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please stand once again. <laughs>
Well, I'm really good at tying knots, you know that? That's right. <laughs> hey, so uh, I think there's a theme going on. I went to listen to uh, Sunday school, and Bert was stealing my stuff, too. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think I believe him when he says he's struggling finding material. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we're going to start in Romans 15 real briefly. So if you just want to turn there, I want to give you a brief recap of, of uh, last week. We're diving into uh, kind of exploring uh, a little bit deeper verse 14 of Romans chapter 15. So as you get there and you just want to join in, just reading this, this one verse with me. It says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now I originally planned to start and do this in order, but it didn't lay out that way. So we're going to start in the middle, and we're going to, we're going to talk about knowledge today. And what, what I love about this is uh, we're going we're gonna to approach this differently than what I would normally do, uh, laying out knowledge. And we're going to kind of look at it as an adornment, as a, as a cloaking, a covering of some of the, the great aspects that Christ has to give. Now, ladies, how many of you have been known to change your clothes multiple times in 15 minutes. Right? I know there's a bunch of you. Now, guys, have you ever got dressed and have your ladies change your clothes for you in 15 minutes? Right? <laughs> what we're learning, gentlemen, is the adorning process is time-consuming. Right? But that's the whole part. That's the whole part when it comes to Christ, is that we want to be cloaked with the greatness of God, and that all starts with knowledge. It all starts with knowledge, just as, as uh, Proverbs chapter 1 says, the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Okay, so, so just a, as a recap from last week, because we're building off of this in the next couple weeks, our church's goal is to proclaim the word of God in a relevant uncompromising, Christ-centered manner so as to help believers grow in their faith and to lead unbelievers to a knowledge of the saving power of Jesus Christ. We're going to do this specifically uh, in these next several months leading into next year by Romans 15, of what we're looking at, verses 1 through 14. And here's the re brief recap there. It's by bearing the weaknesses of those who are weaker in the faith, right? who are struggling with things in their life or who are or new believers, or just have a weak area that they're trying to gain more knowledge and grab a better hold of. We're going to be doing this by living with the hope of Christ, not defeated, not out of a, a sense of fear, but out of a sense of victory, because Christ has already won the victory. We're going to be living unified through the mind of Jesus Christ, not through our own individual minds. We're called to come together through Scripture, through what Jesus has already laid out before us in the Word of God, and we're going to, above all, glorify the name of our Lord God no matter what else happens. We have confidence and assurance to do so. Now, I share with you uh, uh, another definition. The goal of every true church, not just our own church, but this is, this is speaking of every gospel-preaching church as well, we want to be a people so passionate in their devotion to the Lord and zealous for other nations to love and worship the true God, that their corporate testimony would reverberate through the world. That's what we're hoping for every gospel preaching church, that they are so passionate. It doesn't matter where you live, what color your skin may be, whether you're man or woman, or boy or, or, uh, or slightly older, right? We want people to just recognize that Jesus is who he says he is. That's what we're after. And, for, and, and verse 14 lays that out for us. To grow more spiritually mature through our increase in God's goodness and knowledge of him and our, our, and our admonishment of one another, our helping, our correcting, our, our loving of one another. And here's the simple version, once again. 
to not play church, but become the church that Christ has commanded us to be. Right? Just to not show up on Sunday mornings, but to live it everywhere we go. Everywhere that God takes us. Which brings us to knowledge. How many of you know stuff? Right? How, many, how much of it is useful? Okay, I know a lot of stuff about a lot of things, and I only know a little thing about the things I should. So it's, it's, the, it's the gaining of knowledge. So here is the, I'm going to give you a basic definition just to start off with. General intelligence, right? So the gain of general intelligence, understanding through experience or association. Isn't that how we make memories or attach knowledge with memories? You learn something. You see something. You can picture things. I learned this because I did this wrong. I'm not going to do that again. Or I learned this because I did it right, and it worked really well, and we're going to keep doing it that way. However, here's the question I'm going to ask you starting off. Is all knowledge truth? Pretty interesting question to think about, isn't it? Because aren't we told right now that whatever truth that you think is true is actually right in our society? It's crazy. I understand. But we have to keep that in mind. A lot of times, even when it is right, knowledge doesn't leave room for change in a person. We cast a judgment. We make that conclusion. This is who they are. This is who they're going to be. This is, this is their past. They're never going to change from that. I really really despise hearing the statement, people are always the same, they're never going to change. Well, if that's the case, then everything that the Bible has to say about the transformation that Christ brings would be false. Right? It's crazy. But here's the truth. Here's the good one. Truth and virtue. Virtue is really moral excellence. Okay? So truth and virtue are inseparable. You can't have God's truth without having a level of moral excellence. Where does it all come from? It comes from the standard that God sets, from his own character, from his own personhood. Just like faith and a good conscience from 1 Timothy 1 can't be separated. If you have great faith, it means you have the conscience of God that lives inside of you. So let me give you a more specific definition. This is the godly definition of knowledge. It is deeper, it is enhanced, enlarged knowledge of things which belong to God for the more advanced. Interesting. There's a challenge there. Where do you want to sit? Where do you want to be? Do you want to be advancing in your knowledge of God, or are you content with what you know? Right? And that's, that, that, that's, just, the, that's just the point. The more you advance and the more you learn and the more you study about God, the more God reveals himself. We don't learn about God until God shows us stuff. Thankfully, he's already given us the word of God, but there is so much more that God does for us. Right, this is where it all starts. This is where everything gets rooted. And this is where the majority uh, of God's revealing comes. So we, we do know that, and we do want to be part of that, but there is more. But how do we get those things? Right, how do we get a deeper, more enhanced, enlarged knowledge of who God is. Do we just stumble upon these things? Or does God give us what we can handle exactly when we need it so we can do something great for him? And for our benefit, on top of that as well. Is there a greater work, is there a greater work being done that sometimes we fail to recognize or even acknowledge? Right? Well, let me give you a foundation of knowledge. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at two pieces of Scripture today. And I don't want to startle you, but I may actually preach shorter today. So I don't want you to lose your breath. All right? And, and, and keep this as an expectation. So <laughs> but Colossians chapter 2, just, just two verses. Verses 2 and 3. It says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this is great, because this is the foundation that we're building off of. This is the overarching, just generalized uh, principles. And then we're going to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 
that Bert already talked about 50% of it for me. So if you were there, you get it twice. It was great. I, I loved hearing it. It was pretty good. It says, but here's the goal. And the goal is really found at the end of verse 2, and it's unfolding the mystery of God. In your study of God, in your personal life, when you come to church, when you go to Bible studies, does everything come naturally in your understanding? You think, God, you're a simple God. Or do you read some stuff and think, what in the world are you talking about? Right? There, there are things that are, are harder for us to understand, but the mystery of God and aspects of this, and really what it's referring to right here, is salvation in Jesus Christ. The work of the cross. The mystery of God. Those things that people find foolish, yet God uses for wisdom. What a wonderful God that we have has already been referenced this morning, our God did something that we could not do. We can't pay for our own sin, or make ourselves righteous, I should say. We can't, we can't take something that's already slightly dirty and make it clean unless we have something first that is pure and clean. God sent his son on that cross to pay that penalty that we could not pay, Willingly, willingly walk. Now, I don't know about you, but there are people in this world that I struggle with. A lot. And there are some that I struggle with less. And there are some that I don't want to see, and there are some that I want to see for a short period of time. Right? But the truth is, that's not how God sees us. That's great. Because even through our failures and our struggles and our problems that we want to do, God never had that issue that we do. Right? Jesus never had that issue where it says, I don't want to do this for, for, for uh, my brothers and sisters, and I don't want to do this to please my Father. It was always, this is what I'm going to do. And there was a great struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it was all about... <laughs> Will I, or, or because he was human, he knew what type of torture he was going to face. He knew that, but he was willingly going there. He wasn't afraid of what was going to happen. It was just, I'm going to be separated from my father for the first time ever. But in the end, every single individual who calls out on the name of Jesus Christ is going to be sitting right there with me in glory. What a great God that we have. So that's the goal, the unfolding of the mystery of God. And by the way, that, that mystery is going to keep unfolding even when God takes you to heaven. We get to spend an eternity learning about all those great mysteries. But that is the, the main one. Here, here's some other mysteries that are written through Scripture. Do you realize this mystery is both revealed in the Old and New Testament? They go together purposely. The Old Testament reveals more about the character of God the Father and who he is and how he does things and why he created the earth and, and, and what he wants from us. The New Testament reveals the purpose of the Son and that Jesus was given all things and he will one day return. They're not separate. They are not separate. When everything was created in Genesis 1, the Father and the Son were together, created through the hands of the Son. Revelation, who's sitting together? The Father and the Son are still together. Jesus is going to do the judging, but the Father is still there. Old and New Testament, they go together. This is where the greatest treasures are waiting to be found, unfolding the mysteries of God. The greatest treasures are waiting to be found there. Here's some overall results that are found right in this passage. If we look at it again, we see the first one, that their hearts may be encouraged. How many of you may need some encouragement today? It's okay to admit that. Here's the greatest struggle, especially for us men. We don't want to seem weak. But here's the struggle. Hey, I need some encouragement. It's being vulnerable. That's a struggle. That's a hardship. Being vulnerable. There's some tough times going on. You don't need to give details all the time, but it's, listen, I, I just need some encouragement. What do you got for me? I could use anything. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to help one another. 
But learning in this, our knowledge of God encourages fellow believers because we get to share what we have learned with somebody else who may need to hear it. That's exciting to me. That's how bodies grow and are built. And the second thing that, that we see that's right there is we are knit together in love. It's the unity of body of Christ. We are knit together in the love of Jesus Christ. And the last one, which is, which is uh, mind-boggling, it's trying to grab your, your <laughs> full understanding of this, is, it says, in attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. Understanding is one of the greatest riches you will ever have in your life. Understanding of Jesus, of the Father, of his work that is going on around you, of his work that is going on in you. It's God revealing himself is really the greatest wealth you will ever experience. It's not money. It's not stuff. It's not where God takes you, even though those things are all fine and they're all good unless your love for them surpasses the love for God. But your greatest riches exist within the creator of all life. And those three together is where we find our deep, intimate knowledge. It establishes and strengthens sound doctrine. But here's the, here's the trick. We can't pick and choose what Scripture says. It's already written for us. We either believe it and we live it, or we reject it and deny it. That's how it works. It's, it's an all-or-nothing type of thing. Do I believe this or do I not believe it? It doesn't mean we don't struggle with some things. We're going to struggle with some, our, some of our understanding, and God will straighten that out when we get there. And that's the purpose of, of or part of the purpose of prayer and, and sharing things with one another. It's being uh, laid out for us, and that's part of our learning. But sometimes our greatest treasures, the things that we know that we need, get replaced with paper copies and fake trophies. The things we can hang on a wall instead of things that build our heart. Now here's, <clears throat> throughout my, my young life, as I've been reminded, I'm just a, a whippersnapper. I've received a lot of trophies and a lot of awards, and this is before all the uh, everybody gets a trophy type of thing. There's been some, some large recognitions. Uh, at one point, when I could actually move, I was an honorable mention for, in college for uh, an All-American All-Star. You know where that certificate is? Couldn't tell you. And it really doesn't mean anything to me now. I've probably had over 30 or 40 trophies, and I, don't, I, I threw them all away. They mean absolutely nothing now, besides a memory and a fine memory and a good memory. What matters and what has been taught into me, and thankfully God is so faithful, is the riches of the word that keep unfolding, because there is what sustains. So this morning, unlike, unlike last, uh, last week, I was very technical with you with moralistic therapeutic deism. If you weren't here last week, go listen. It takes a while to explain it all. So listen to last week, but this week I just want to give you some very specific <clears throat> easier, uh, applicable attributes that the Word of God lays out for us when we put on the adornment of knowledge, right? the cloak of knowledge, when we chase after these things. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're just going to look at a couple verses, verses 4 through 8. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to point out some specific blessings and increase of the knowledge of God brings to your life. So in verses 4 through 8, it says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I have six things, six things that I want to point out to you this morning that knowledge brings out of this. When we put on more knowledge, when God reveals himself, when you grab a hold of it at a, at a greater level, there's six things that God gives you, right? That God specifically gives you. And the first one is found right in verse 4, and it's an increase in grace. 
How many of you love more grace in your life? Right? When people talk to you, do you like the unabridged version or the more gracious version? Usually, please be gracious with me. <laughs> right? That's what we hear. Some of you can't handle the gracious version and need the truthful version. But that's okay, because that's based off of how we are gifted. But grace covers a lot of areas in our life, a lot of, lot of different attributes. So it's not just one thing. And we have to be careful that we don't minimize God's gift of grace. Here, here's some things that grace actually gives and covers. Joy. We need to live with joy. There's no getting around it. You need to be a joyous Christian. You don't need to be happy all the time. There's a big difference. Right? Joy is because this is what God is doing inside of my heart, and he sustains me, and he gives me hope, and I can be joyous today because the promises that lay out there for me are eternal. Right? Happiness is fleeting. Things are going my way. Things are not going my way. This broke. This got fixed, whatever the case may be. But what about pleasure? Is pleasure in this life more uh, 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 drawing you more than a pleasure of, of God right now or, or the pleasures that have yet to come? Or loveliness? Or one of my favorite ones is the favor of God. Man, this is where we want to be. The favor of God. Do we seek after, chase after the favor of God? The implement of, of, of his grace. I, I promise you now, and this is what the word says, the more you chase after knowledge and seek after knowledge of who God is, the more God gives you favor to do something with it. Not to just store it away, to do something with it. Or this, grace, the ability to speak well in public. Many of you, don't put me up here. I don't want to go up front. I can't speak well. That gift is given by God. And it may sound foolish when you're speaking, and yet be one of the greatest things that people hear in their life because that's the favor of God upon you. Or gratitude. How much more do we need to be gracious and thankful for, for what God gives us or what people have done for us? And here's, here's, here's the last one I'm going to give you, and the list goes on and on. The divine influence upon the heart. And here's the greatness about the grace of God. Okay? You don't control the results. You don't control how people hear you, what they hear. Many of you have already mentioned things about what you've heard in sermons. That wasn't my main point that I was trying to get across for many of those. But it's what you need to hear that God brought to you. That's the greatness of God. Because he put the truth right into your heart from his word. That's the greatness of our God. That's called grace. And when God puts you somewhere, it's because he believes that you have influence or you're, you're going to be used over and to somebody else's life. There's a second thing we see right there in verse 4, and it is this. Godly recognition. Everybody loves recognition. There's no doubt about it. Hey, you did this. Thank you for doing that. Uh, put your name on a plaque. Shake your hand give you some cookies, maybe a pie, and then all those little things. <clears throat> I'm just giving you ideas in case you, uh, you know, feel like being gracious at some point in the future. <laughs> but when it's all said and done, it stands nothing next to the, great, or the, the recognition that God gives you. And here's the great one. That's my son. That's my daughter. They're part of my family. There is no greater recognition than God claiming you as his own. And he gives freely a gift of Jesus Christ to you. It's a special claim. It's a special attention claim. It's a claim of ownership. Right? Some, of, some, some people struggle with this. I don't want to be owned by anybody. Well, you're, you're owned. You're a slave to either sin or you're a slave to righteousness. So you're either owned by, by something that will never lead you anywhere or you are owned by the God who created you, loves you, and wants you to be with him forevermore. That is the great claim, our, our great Christ. But here is, 
Here's the other thing that goes with this claim. God has the ability to make it because he knows you better than anybody else. He knows every detail of your life perfectly and accurately. What a great God we have. What a great God. I want you to think about that in in particular when you are struggling with a certain area in your life and you don't think that God loves you. He knows every detail that is going on in your life. We may not understand everything that goes on, but we know that he works everything out for good for all of his children. And then we have verse 5. The third thing that comes along, that you were enriched in everything by him. I love that word, enriched. In all utterance and all knowledge. And that third thing is that meaningful and thought-provoking speech. Right? Knowledge. The more you know about something, the more you're able to talk about it. The less you know, the dumber you sound. You remember? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You do. Right? When you, when you, you, you talk with somebody, and they think they know a lot, and that happens to be your field. You think, no, that's how it actually works. No, that's actually how it works. You ever have this uh, conversation with your kids as parents? Hey, I still know stuff. Right? My dad reminds me of this regularly, by the way. Hey, remember when I told you that? No. <laughs> but it's that meaningful and thought-provoking speech. But th- what it's particularly f- referring to right here is the evangelism of the lost. God gives us the ability to step out into a public setting to give them the word of God, the written word of God in spoken form, so that we can evangelize the lost. It's the enablement of us, the believer, to speak the effectiveness of his word. Do you believe that God's word is effective 100% of the time, even when we don't see something? We should. We need to. Now, here's the, here's the problem with this, a misinterpretation of this passage. The utterance. Utterance is really speech. Now, at this time, and this is what, this is what Bert was pointing out in, in Sunday school, at this time, there was a gift of tongues. It was the establishment of the church. I'm going to give you some very basic background and build on to what Bert was saying. This gift of tongues was so people could hear the word of God in their language and understand what God has to say. That is the gift of tongues. When you travel throughout America, what's our language? English. When God speaks to you, it will be in your language when somebody speaks to you. If you go to another country, normally... There is somebody, an interpreter, that comes with you. So when you speak, they interpret the word of God to somebody else. That's how the gift of tongues and the things work. Now, I will tell you, we're not going to limit what God does. Because God is still God. So if he travels you out into the middle of the jungle, and he gives you the ability to speak to somebody in a language that you have never learned for a temporary purpose, potentially that happens so they can hear the word of God in their language and understand it. It is not a permanent thing. God does what God does. Okay, but we have to understand that. And it includes more than that. It includes prophecy. It includes discernment. It includes the interpretation of God's word. And it definitely includes the influence over the heart because God's spirit works on the heart 100% of the time. It's always working on us. Just to give you an example, a more in-depth example, if we look at Luke chapter 2, right? Luke, Luke chapter 2 is, uh, is the, the passage that is not referenced, the end of Luke chapter 2, it's not referenced a lot because it, it speaks of Jesus' teenage years. It's very short, it's very sweet. Uh, in verse 40, it's kind of that cutoff, right? Verse 40 is the end of his early years, and then it goes into 12 years later in that, in that realm. But verse 40, Talking of Jesus, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Why? Because he was steadfastly learning about who his father was from teachers and from his parents that were there. And then you jump to verse 46 and 47. It says, so it was after three days, his parents found him in the temple. You ever left your kid at a store? 
Right? I know some of you are guilty. First thing is, why did you run away? Or, are you okay? Right? We have this example here where Jesus was all about his father's business. It says, it was after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. This is the influence that God has upon an individual. The more you study, the more you learn, the more you, you seek to gain knowledge of God, the more influence you have over any age, because it is God who is working, it is not us. And then it finishes off in verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And this is the type of thing that Paul is referencing in, uh, to the Corinthian church. When you gain knowledge, you increase in wisdom, you increase in stature, and you increase in favor with God and men. And I'll tell you this. If you increase in favor with God, there will be people who do not like it. And there will be people who will respect it and love it. Your goal is to honor God above everything else. And that should be our priority. Because he will bring us to those individuals who need this. I'm going to give you a quote by Matthew Henry, who, who talks about this in one of his commentaries. About the knowledge that God gives his children. It says, where God has given these two gifts, speech and knowledge, he has given great capacity for usefulness. Many have the flower of utterance or speech that has not the root of knowledge. In other words, people can talk really well but have absolutely no understanding of what they're talking about. We had a president not too long ago that was pretty good at that. It's just my opinion. By the way, if you're here last week, you know I also think I'm right a lot. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it says, but it says in their converse is barren. It says, many have the treasure of knowledge and want utterance or the ability to employ it for the good of others, and then in a manner is wrapped up in a napkin. In other words, they know a lot of stuff but can't say a single thing, so it's like a, a present in a box that you can't uh, unwrap and, un, and open and only you know. But where God gives both, a man is qualified for eminent usefulness, and I pray that this is your desire today. That in your knowledge, you ask for God to help you use it. The more you learn, the more you can share, the more you can give. There's a fourth thing found in verse 6 back in 1 Corinthians. It says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, you are sealed by the Spirit of God. That's the great assurance. You are sealed. It happens at the moment of salvation, the moment you accept, you truly accept Jesus Christ and Savior as Lord. So here's what I'm going to tell you. There is a debate amongst denominations in churches about when you are sealed by the Spirit. Does it happen uh, once, or do you have to do it all the time? Here's what Scripture says. Book of 1 John speaks specifically of this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are His. Names written in the book of life once and for all. all right? That is the assurance of that we have. This is what the author or the writer John specifically mentions over and over again. But the debate is, so you understand in your conversations with others, is the Old Testament is often taken out of context in comparison with the New Testament. In several examples, God gave the Spirit to certain people in the Old Testament for a specific purpose, for a certain task. If they didn't do it, he removed the spirit from him and he gave it to somebody else who would fulfill that task. But then we get to the New Testament. And here's what Jesus says specifically. I have to leave so that you can get the greater gift. Right? The spirit did not come upon all men until Jesus fulfilled his mission. And once Jesus fulfilled his mission and entered the doorway into heaven, allowed us access into heaven by that, that means and that manner, now we are filled with the Spirit permanently, if you know Jesus. That was a good spot for an amen, by the way. All right? That's what we're after. Your testimony. What we're looking for, my testimony. 
We want it to be visibly seen by God for his glory. We want, to be, we want it to be visibly seen by others to point the way to Jesus Christ for his glory. But there's a, there's a fifth thing in verse 7. It says, so that you come short in no gift, spiritual gifts, right? This is the edification of the church. Each one of you has been given at least one spiritual gift by the Father. At least one. I'm going to say multiple, right? Multiple. But there is at least one thing that you are really good at. Whether you are incredibly good at being merciful to those who are hurting and in need and are able to feel that, that empathy and sympathy for people and share in that burden. Some of you are really good stewards on how it goes about. Some of you are great helpers. Right? So we're, we're looking for more of that unrefined uh, uh, teaching gift so we can help you be more refined in that process as we speak. Some of you are great evangelists. When you go out, you don't have any fear or problems talking with people out in public. These are the great gifts. And what are they designed to do? Build the body to work easier, smoothly, better to portray the name of Jesus Christ. This is the use. Second to none. And we don't want that thought of, well, this church does this better than our church. We want to do what God has asked us to do faithfully and leave the results up to God. We don't want to be jealous of somebody else or envious of somebody else. And if that's the case, we're not tapping into that spirit-led gift. Right? We're just tapping into the human fears. But there is a last thing, a sixth thing. And boy, this is where we need to be in, in, at the end in verse 8. Who will also confirm you to the end, that you may blame, be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have an eager expectation for the return of the king? Oh, man. I prefer not to plan my retirement. If you know full well, pastors don't have a retirement. Right? We shouldn't. Because our mission is to preach the word of God until God takes us home. Now, whether we're standing in front of a church or not, that, that's our mission. That's our goal. Your retirement may speak of financially, but not spiritually. And not until God calls you home and then you get to do some fine learning at that point in time. But eagerly waiting. It's a future perspective. It's how you battle through problems that you don't understand here in this earth right now. That future perspective. It should be a motivation for godly living. Right? It's established by Jesus for what he did his work on the cross and raising from the grave. We want to be found above reproach. That's the whole goal, to be found blameless, right? above reproach or unable to be accused of wrongdoing. When we stand in the courtroom, and we're going to stand in God's courtroom, in essence. Now, the beautiful thing is, our attorney is Jesus. They're covered by my blood. Case done. But if not, then you have to answer. You have to answer for a life that's not found before the Lord, the Lord God. And that's the that's the very hard part for us. There's a lot of heartbreak when we see family members and loved ones reject this type of truth. Do not give up hope. You were called to live with hope because if God saved you, he can save anybody. God saved me, he can save anybody. Right? The most, just, just as a reminder, the most influential people in Scripture had a problem with murder. You know that? They faced consequences for it too. Just as we face consequences for our own sin. But God wiped that slate clean and said, listen, I've got something better for you. And there they went. Living the life for the Lord. I want to give you a, I want to give you a quote as we close up here from an author you wouldn't think that would give you a scripture quote. From J.R.R. Tolkien. All true knowledge of God is born out of obedience. Chief purpose of life for any of us is to increase accordingly or according to our capacity, our knowledge of God by all means we have, and to be moved by it to praise and thanks. 
No man can attain to the knowledge of God but by humility. All true knowledge of God is born out of obedience. So as you leave here today, just ask yourself a couple little questions. Are you being obedient in your lifestyle? You don't, you don't need to share that with, with, with others unless God draws you to that. Are you being obedient to your daily devotions to learn more and more about God? Are, are you being obedient to what God wants you to do? Being held back by a spirit of fear, or are you eager to share the goodness of God with that individual God has placed upon your heart? If you feel like you're unworthy to do so, your worthiness is found in the greatness of Jesus. If he brings you there, he's going to carry you there. If he carries you there, he's going to give you victory there. You may not see it on this end, but he will. Just remember, as this says, the greatest amount of knowledge you will ever learn comes through a spirit of humility and not of pride. Let God lead you. Let him reveal himself to you. Grab a hold of it. Ask questions. Share it. If you put those six things, or if you allow God through your life, to put those six things on for you. You are going to live a powerful life for Jesus Christ. And that's what people need to see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Father, I just want to thank you for, for the living word that, can, that cannot be erased. The power that's there Father, when we read it as a church, as I read it as, a, as an individual, sometimes I forget, sometimes we forget that it's okay and it's honoring to you to be brought to our knees in a spirit of humility. Lord, there are things that we need to learn about you. And there's a possibility that we could be struggling and, and just hindering your, your revelation of those things in our life. Lord, I pray that you would give us a spirit of submission this morning in the areas that we struggle with. That you would increase the hope for the return of our King to keep that future perspective of, of knowing that we already have the end of the story written down for us. But Lord, that we put on that the spirit of hope today no matter what life struggle we have, or even the blessings of life that we may be facing right now or being uh, uh, just absolutely loved on with. Father, no matter the case, I pray that our eyes are always on you and that we just want to see more of you. Just as Moses says, we want to see your face. We want to see it so badly that it alters our physical appearance and radiates your glory, Father. May that be our heart's cry today. We just ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. I say we have coffee and snacks out there. By all means, please stick around with us. Share in some fellowship. Share a praise with someone today about what God's doing in your life. Have a great day.